You're listening to the Just Japan Podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. Hey there, everyone, and welcome to episode number 119 of the Just Japan Podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. My name is Kevin O'Shea, and I am the host of the Just Japan Podcast, a weekly podcast that brings you different aspects of life in Japan, hobbies in Japan, food in Japan, people living in Japan, working in Japan, being entrepreneurs in Japan. Every episode is a very Different thing. And this is the week leading up to the Rio Games. Actually, no, this is the week where the Rio Games begin the Summer Olympics 2016. On Friday, August the 5th, the Rio Games will have their opening ceremony. And you know what? Hey, what's going on with Team Japan, especially with regards to athletics? You know what? When I want to know what's going on in the world of athletics, there's only one person to go to here in Japan, and that would be. Brett Larner. Brett Larner is the man behind the Japan Running News website, and he was on episode number one, oh, sorry, number 16 of the Just Japan podcast, 103 episodes ago. And it's been a long time, too long. And this week, for episode number 119, we're going to be bringing Brett back onto the podcast to talk about the Rio Games, Team Japan, who we can watch for in athletics in Japan, and, you know, who are the people to watch for. And what are the possibilities of winning some medals? We also chat a little bit about the doping scandal, the Russian doping scandal, but not a lot. Mostly we're focusing on positive things, Team Japan, and all that stuff. And I'm really excited、uh, for you guys to listen to this week's episode because it was a really great interview. All right, so it's summer, the dog days of summer. It's hot and humid in the Kansai region of Japan, and it's, it's a real struggle for me to get through these humid days. Um, you know, humidity up to 80%, 90%. It's rough. It's so hot. But we cope, we cope, and we look at the positive sides of the sweat. And、uh, this weekend, coming up here in Kobe, Japan, where I'm based out of, on、uh, Saturday, August 6th, we have the Kobe Fireworks, the Minato Hanabi. It's a big event for me and my family. We love it. The kids put on their little jinbeis, and we head on down. Uh, to the waterfront with our picnic mat, and we stretch it out, and we got lots of snacks for the kids and juice drinks for the kids. And my, wa- my wife and I have snacks too, e d a m a m e and beer, and all kinds of cool stuff. And it's a really wonderful event to go to. And the following evening, we have our local big community, Mat City, our summer dance festival, and that's going to be awesome. We'll be heading out to that as well, of course. Kids wearing their j i m b e i s and、um, you know, games will be played, prizes will be won. Um, beer will be consumed, all that stuff. It's, it's a really great time, and we're looking forward to it.、Um, now, of course, I, I want to throw it there to, to you guys. Of course, you know, the Just Japan podcast is all over the place. We're on iTunes, we're on Stitcher Radio, we're on SoundCloud, we're on Google Play, we're on Libsyn, all over the place, guys. And you can find out all the links to the Just Japan podcast in the show notes. Go to the show notes page, the main page、uh, at justjapanstuff.com. Justjapanstuff.com. Go there, and all the links will be there to the social media for the podcast. Of course,、um, you know, if you want to see lots of cool pictures of these fireworks I'm talking about, of the mats that I'll be going to, you definitely got to follow me on Instagram, guys, gals. You got to do it at JLandKev, J L A N D K E V.、Um, I'm, I'm pretty frequent with posting photos on Instagram, especially since I am a Kobe public relations ambassador、um, promoting tourism in the city of Kobe. I'm also going to put links to the Kobe PR Ambassadors page. I live in the city of Kobe here in Japan. I love this place. It's an awesome place. You should come and check it out. If you're coming to Japan, I know most people always think about、uh, Tokyo, Osaka, Kyoto, Kobe's. It's in the Kansai. It's really close to, to Osaka. It's worth a trip, worth checking out.、Um, it's a cool place. A lot of great food, a lot of great music,、uh, a lot of great sights to see. And all of that stuff. Yeah, so、um, again, the Rio Games are coming at the Summer Olympics. You know, of course, I'm a Canadian, so I'm cheering for Team Canada. But I guess I got two countries to cheer for my adoptive country, I suppose, of Japan. You know, my wife's Japanese, my kids,、um, you know, are dual citizens. 
So, you know, I, I got a stake in, in, in the Japanese thing too, guys. Um, so, uh, Brett Larner was cool enough to come back onto the Just Japan podcast after 103 episodes of being away to talk to us all about the Olympics and his thoughts and, you know, his expertise really is, is impressive. He really knows his stuff. Uh, so sit back and listen to episode number 119 of the Just Japan podcast, uh, where I interview Brett Larner of Japan Running News, all about Japan, Team Japan, and the Olympics. <laughs> All right, everyone, welcome to episode number 119 of the Just Japan podcast. And this evening, we're going to be talking about running in Japan, uh, the Rio games, athletics in Japan, all kinds of cool stuff. And with us this evening is uh, the man behind the uh, Japan Running News website, Brett Larner. Brett, thank you for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to be back. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I mean, now now Brett just mentioned he's. it's a pleasure to be back. Now, for those of you who may be new to the podcast... Brett is one of the original guests. Um, you you are featured in episode number sixteen of 16, the podcast. Sixteen, that's right. Yeah, one six of the uh, and that was uh, entitled Just Japan Podcast one uh, sixteen, Japan the Japan Running News, mm -hmm. and that was in May of two thousand fourteen. So quite a long time ago, and it's great to have you back. Um, so you know, for those out there who may have not listened to that episode. Um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and you know where you live in Japan, and, and what you do here? Sure. Um, I'm originally from Canada. I was born in Winnipeg. Um, I mostly grew up in the United States, uh, all over, uh, okay. all of, um, variety of places due to my dad's work, and then just uh, where I went to school, I, I moved quite frequently. And I've more or less been in Japan since 1997. Um, I, I came here... Um, as a, I, I've always been a runner, um, but I came here for reasons uh, unrelated to running. Um, I came here for graduate school, um, studying traditional Japanese music, and um, just as a runner, got very interested in the Japanese running culture, um, especially at the elite end of it. Uh, there's uh, for for people who may not be aware. Um, Distance running in Japan is a massive, massive spectator sport. Uh, people love watching professional races on TV, and in particular at the New Year holiday, um, there mm. are three days straight of road relays on TV that go on for you know seven hours, you know six, seven hours a day, and they get you know thirty percent viewership ratings. You're talking tens of millions of people sitting down and spending three days watching road relays on 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 TV. And that so will those, those be the uh, the Hakone Ekiden, right? The New Year Ekiden and the Hakone Ekiden, especially the Hakone Ekiden, is is uh, the biggest television event in Japan. And really, really, it, it is the biggest television event. Wow! The thing it gets the single highest uh, ratings of uh, of any event in Japan. Um, so it's it's a real cultural institution, and um, you know, coming from North America, you know, you might, you if you're lucky, you might see the Boston Marathon, maybe the New York Marathon um, on TV, but uh, the the concept of watching distance running on TV was was pretty foreign, and so just kind of tuning in one day and seeing this race and being uh, really amazed by, uh, you know, not, not just the quality of the race, but the quality of the media presentation, um, the way that the, the attention to detail and the way that it was really presented as, uh, as a valuable spectator experience um, really uh, kind of spoke to me and I got, you know, very interested in that. So um, started learning more about it and doing my homework and getting really interested in the distance running scene here. And then uh, in 2007, when Japan hosted the, the World Championships of Athletics in Osaka, um, I started a website called Japan Running News, um, basically trying to fill a gap, an information gap, um, where given the, the, you know, the long history and the high quality of the distance running scene here, there wasn't uh, very much information available in English about any aspect of it, you know, nothing at all about the Hakone Ekiden this massive, massive uh, spectator race in Japan, and I wanted to try to fill that gap. So I started the re the website uh, in 2007, and it's really grown since then. Um, I I've had a lot of other work and opportunities come about as a result of, of doing that website. Um, so, I mean, I, I still am primarily a writer, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, doing writing about Japanese running, but I've been lucky to get involved with um, uh, with a variety of athletes uh, when Jap when top level Japanese athletes want to race outside Japan um, I kind of work with them in a managerial uh, or kind of road manager capacity um, mm. that's, that's one of the things I do um, I do a bit of coaching with an amateur running club 
Um, I've gotten some other work involved with some overseas marathons that want to kind of market themselves to the, the amateur um, Japanese runner mar- uh, market to try to appeal uh, to Japan. You know, you should come to race in, in, in our marathon. So mm. trying to get Japanese people to go overseas. Um, and yeah, just a variety of other things. But uh, yeah, it all just c- comes back to uh, being a runner myself and just being really captivated by... Um, the 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 quality of of the running here and uh the 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 passion and quality with which it's presented to uh to yeah. the average person yeah yeah there's i mean oh god there's a lot of things i want to jump in on and ask you about actually that come from what you just said um first of all um and and this is very i mean you know i i don't have the experience that brett does with running in japan i mean i do have a little bit of running experience um i'm I, I'm, I'm just coming off of a hiatus Mm-hmm. Um, I actually stopped running three years ago, or mm-hmm. about two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, mostly because of having two young children, mm-hmm. and it was kind of, mm, how shall I say, brought to my attention by my better half that it would be best for our family situation if I didn't spend so much time outside right. running around, um, but I'm actually going to be running in this year's Osaka Marathon, Okay. so yeah. my my first marathon in more than three years, so I'm pretty excited. Um, have you started training yet? I have started. Yeah, yep. and it's uh, back to square one. Okay, it's like literally back to I've never run a marathon before. Like that's where I'm at physically. Um, but yeah, I've started. I've started, and and um, you know it's it's cool. I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited. Good. Um, I'm actually I'm very excited. Um, yeah. Um, so, but okay. So what I have noticed in my my time here is is mm-hmm. that distance running there is a huge difference between the way. Not, not even let's not even think about athletes, but fans, people, the regular people who don't run, just mm-hmm. Joe Blow at home. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the way they look, the way Japanese people look at running, mm-hmm. and this is what really confused me. Like, like Japanese when I first came here, um, mm-hmm. is that Japanese runners are household names. Yeah, and I'm not talking about like the, the Usain Bolts of the world who are you know ex- exceptional, you know, amazing. You know, gold, multiple gold medal winners, this and that. But like, you know, like distance runners. Like, um, mm. I mean, my my wife, who is very, you know, will readily admit that she hates running. You mm. know, if if I drop a name of uh, a retired marathon runner who's mm. going to be making an appearance at a race I was at, she's like, mm. oh yeah, I know her. Da 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 da. Yeah, and she can rhyme off some information about her. Totally. Yeah. Um. You know, you could like, you could you could, uh, you could stop just about any random person on the street these days and say. Tell me about Daichi Kamino, and mm. they'll immediately tell you that he was a university runner who uh, ran a spectacular fifth stage at the Hakone Ekiden. Everybody in the country knows that, you know. So yeah, just no, no, people... now, now, why is that? What, what is this? What, what is going on here? What, why in Japan do? Why? I mean, you know, for you know, in America or Canada, mm. distance running is is. I mean, it, it's becoming more popular, obviously, in mm. recent years with like a, a kind of a boom in, in health and fitness. Yeah. But I mean, marathon runners are not household names. Maybe with opposed to someone like, you know, for a while, like Ryan Hall or someone like that. But I mean, for the most part, people don't know anything about marathon runners. True. Yes. What, what, what is the, you know, what's the thing going on here? Why, why is that so, uh, why, why is watching that uh, seven hours of road racing mm-hmm. um, kind of like watching the Super Bowl in America? <laughs> because it kicks ass. And, and, and I agree with you. Yeah, I, no. I completely agree um, with you. But the, my, it's kind of rhetorically speaking for the listeners out there. Yeah. Why does it yeah, kick so uh, much ass? No, uh, I, I think in terms of uh, the, the – I've kind of separated into maybe two different parts there. Um, in terms of the marathoners, uh, I think like most of the people who are really household names are like the really successful Olympians, Olympic medalists and such. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, is the, I think there's a lot of, of kind of a chicken and egg element to the question of why do Japanese people love marathoning so much. But, um, you know, part of it is for a long, long, long time, uh, they had a lot of success and, you know, were arguably the best marathon country in the world for, for a period of history there. And so the people who were the real heroes of that area were like, you know, any any country has its uh, its superstars in the sport that they love. And so the people who were winning Olympic medals in the sport, mm. you know, people still remember who they are. Um, you know, you might ask somebody who, who ran the marathon in, in the London Olympics and they might have a hard time answering that. But, you know, you ask them like, who won the, uh, the a medal in the Atlanta Olympics, and they can tell you off. You know, any, anybody could tell you that immediately. Or, or which uh, which Japanese runner won the Berlin Marathon, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. Um, and then, uh, as 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 far as um, 
maybe both who are not Olympic medalists, you know, like the, the example I brought up, Daichi Kamino, uh, who was the, the Hakone Ekiden fifth stage star. The fifth stage, for those people who've never seen, um, probably most of your listeners who've never seen the Hakone Ekiden, uh, the fifth stage is the last stage on the first day. of the. There, there are five stages on the first day, five on the second day. And the last stage on the first day has about 900 meters of climb. So you're talking like almost a kilometer of climb. Um, over the course of 23 kilometers, and it's really, really, really dramatic. And uh, the school that's won, it's a university race, the school that's won the last two years won uh, in large part because uh, they had a runner who was extremely talented on the uphill and had a spectacular run there. And so you've got this this race, the Hakone Ekiden, that pulls in massive viewership ratings, and um, the people who are running in that and really pulling off, you know, successful kind of heroic performances, um, just as a consequence of that, um, the massive viewership and the media attention that just become a household name. And, uh, the, the more spectacular the performances become, the more and more popular the race itself becomes like anything else when any other sport, I guess, when, uh, when things get more dramatic or more exciting, you know, it's going to pull in more, more fans. And when there's Absolutely. more buzz, there are more fans coming in. And so that's just kind of feeding itself. Um, mm, yeah. so, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think like if you look over the last ten years or so, um, the university running in the Hakone Ekiden has the ex- popularity of it. It's always been popular, but it has really exploded over the last ten years. Mm. Um, and you know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's connected, but that also parallels uh, what you you mentioned about the kind of boom in the in the amateur running that's happened over the last ten years. Um, since the Tokyo Marathon got started, so I'm kind of going off on a, on a different tangent here. But, no um, problem. Go ahead. Um, when the Tokyo Marathon started in 2007, um, you know, the, at the amateur level, you know, there had always been very serious Japanese uh, amateur runners. Um, yeah. A lot of, you know, a lot of marathons established in Japan and people were very serious. Uh, like most things, you know, Japanese people, if they do something as a hobby, tend to be very serious about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they yeah. Don't, don't do things very uh, half-heartedly and so kind yeah. of... Pre two thousand seven, if you were uh, if your hobby was marathon running, you were you were pretty good by mm-hmm. and large. Um, and people who wanted maybe wanted to like try a marathon or something would basically go off to Honolulu and uh, and do it there, and then you know that would cross it off their bucket list and that. But with the Tokyo Marathon in two thousand seven, um, with the first running of it, then uh, everything kind of changed, and uh, the the landscape has completely changed. Like just about. Every city in Japan has massive uh, marathons now. Um, I did an article in uh, in January that looks at the last ten years of um, amateur marathoning worldwide, and specifically in the United States and Japan. And um, what? I, so I don't I don't have it open at the moment. I don't have the numbers, the, the the accurate numbers available. But basically, worldwide over the last ten years, the number of people who have finished full marathons has more or less doubled. And uh, in the United States, it grew very slightly uh, until about three years ago. And then the number of people finishing marathons in the United States has started to has peaked out and has started to drop over the last few years. But the number of people finishing uh, full marathons in Japan has increased dramatically to the point mm-hmm. that last year, for the first time in history, Japan surpassed the United States as the world's largest amateur marathon market in terms oh, wow. of in terms of number of people finishing a full marathon oh, per year, wow. more people finished a full marathon in Japan in 2015 than in the United States, which is a first in history. And, yeah, well, I mean, the uh, U.S. has like three times the population, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's that, that, that number includes people coming from overseas, and mm. it includes people doing more than one marathon. It's the total number of finishers. Mm. Um, but, you know, the, the, the point still stands that it's the first time that Japan had more marathon finishers, whoever they were, uh, than... United States. Oh, wow. And if you look at major marathons, mm-hmm. that in terms of marathons with 10,000 or more, the, over the last 10 years, the United States has uh, fallen from nine races. I, I believe the number, I, I'm sorry if it's not exactly accurate, I have to look it up uh, again. I have to open up the article again, but um, I believe it was nine marathons uh, in the United States dropping to seven currently that have 10,000 or more finishers. Um, in Japan, the number grew from three or four ten years ago to about twenty-five last year. Oh, really? Wow! And so, close to half the, that's that, and that number represents about half the number of marathons, slightly less than half the number of marathons in the world that have ten thousand or more finishers are now in Japan. Hmm. And if you look at the rate of progress of both of those things, the number of finishers and the number of mega marathons, both of them are still on the way up. And so, like the, the trend is still growing, growing, growing here. So you've got. 
a huge explosion in popularity of uh, Japanese marathons. I mean, you haven't, I guess you haven't been running for the last couple of years, but you know what it's like trying to get into a Japanese marathon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, even like for this year, I mean, um, you know, like, uh, you know, getting back into running is something I've wanted to do. And for me, I'm the kind of person where if I'm not registered for a marathon, I don't have the motivation to run. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I'm one of those people. Some people are like that, right? You know, you, you, you get the golden ticket, you yeah. pay the money. You, and, and in the case of the Kobe marathon, it's like, Actually, it was like uh, fourteen thousand seven hundred yen. I paid. That's a lot of money. That's yeah. like it's about one hundred and seventy Canadian dollars. Um, you know, so I'm gonna do it. <laughs> but I mean, I applied for the Osaka Marathon. I didn't. I got rejected from that. Mm-hmm. And last year, I applied for the Kyoto, and I was rejected from that. Okay. Um, you know, like back in two thousand and ten, I ran Tokyo, mm-hmm. and then I applied for four years after that in a row. I was rejected. Yep. Yep. You know, I mean, it's just, and and I even saw even like local small races that like in two thousand and eight that was when I came to Japan. Mm-hmm. I was doing a lot of like half marathons and ten k's and stuff like that. And in two thousand eight, it was really really easy for me to to just like apply and get into these races. Mm-hmm. And then I just saw, especially with um, when uh, uh, Hozuma Kampe Kampe San, mm-hmm. uh, the the Osaka based comedian who ran around the world. Mm-hmm. After he did his run, or like near the end of his run, he was, you know, when he was like being sponsored by New Balance, and he had like the Kampe San shoes and the 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 cool hat and all the whole thing, and it, that like I I just saw this running boom happening, and it mm-hmm. got harder and harder to get into races, and then races that I had run before, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, it's you know, it's like uh, December, I'm going to apply for this February race. What? It's full. What? It's yeah, not. Yeah. It's full. And then people are like, oh, it was full a few months ago. I'm like, but like just two years ago, I applied now when I got in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, because a lot of the smaller races are first come, first serve, right? Yep. yep. And um, you know, just I've noticed it's just harder and harder to get into races. It's very difficult. It, it's it's. I mean, I think that says a lot because even even like little like backwater races, it's really exactly. hard to get into. Yeah, yeah, and um, and even looking at like these these larger races, I mean, every season, every fall, every spring, there are new marathons that you know are, are like. Nine, ten thousand field size, and you know you're thinking like, okay, the number of those races has to be finite, but they keep making more and more of them, and every one of them, every time, it's like boom, sold out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Or there's a lottery where there's two, at least two, three times the number of people uh, who uh, who um, are applying uh, relative to the, the maximum field size. So well, it's, I mean, it's, Tokyo it's, now is like I've heard the numbers in recent years. I mean, that's like thirty thousand runners, thirty-three thousand runners, and I've heard that it's now pushing. Um, like three, four hundred thousand applicants. Yeah, that's 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 true. It's been that way for a while. So you get uh, to the point where you basically get like a one in ten chance of getting in. Yep. yep. And and my 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 history proves that. I mean, the first year I applied, I got in, mm-hmm. and then I thought, oh, it's because I'm a foreigner, and I applied, and, uh, no problem. Mm-hmm. And then I applied the next year, it's like, nope, sorry. Oh, oh. wait. <laughs> I, so I think like I think if you, if you tie that back, like those kind of numbers that we're talking that we're talk about the last few minutes uh, relative to the the amateur market you know that's that's a, there's a lot of money there um you know uh, um the the i think the marketing of distance running to the japanese market has been very good in terms of marketing gear mm. um you know japanese people love to buy gear by and large and, oh yeah oh yeah uh, and a lot of uh, the the major manufacturers and minor manufacturers have been very successful at marketing gear, uh, marketing running is a gear sport, and so there's a lot of money involved, and so especially leading up to a marathon, like I mean, I'm in Kobe. Uh-huh. This is the home of Osics. I mean, I'm live. I live on Port Island in Kobe. The Osics World Headquarters is yeah. literally a couple blocks away. Okay. And for those of you who play Pokemon Go, there's a couple of good Pokemon stops around there. Ooh, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, but that's a whole other issue, and that's yeah. actually next week's podcast. Um, but. but- uh, Sorry, what I was just going to say with that, just to tie it back to your original question, that this wasn't a completely pointless tangent going off, um, was that I think since Japan has this kind of legacy of, um, you know, successful marathon runners and people are generally, the average person is generally knowledgeable to who they are because they love their domestic sports stars and that, and, you know, they love their Olympic medalists, um, Mm -hmm. that there's there's that kind of legacy. And then you've got the Hakone Ekiden becoming very, very popular and, and, you know, making like distance running seem cool, you know, like, you know, cool young university kids going out and rocking and and tens of millions of people watching it and everybody loving it. Mm -hmm. And then a massive, massive growth in a domestic market and lots and lots of money there that all those things kind of tied together mean that um, the the elite end of the sport is very popular. Mm. 
it's a, it's a such a different beast than in in um in Canada or America. I mean, because like distance running just isn't that sexy sport. Yeah. I mean, everyone when you think of running, what do you think of? You think of the hundred meters. You think mm-hmm. of like the, the sprinters, right? Or or other more explosive sports. You know, yeah. the the swimming, the Michael Phelps of the world, the this and that. Um but but in Japan, I mean, yeah, it's different. It's, it's very cool, it's very awesome. And this yeah. someone who's a fan of running and runners and all of that stuff, I, I really think it's cool. Yeah. Um yeah. Okay, so okay, we're we're not we're just weeks away from the Rio games. Yes. The the Summer Olympics. Um can you tell us a little bit about this year's or some of some of the runners to watch for this year uh coming out of Japan in the Rio games? Yeah, yeah. Um you know, I, I think it's uh in in a lot of events it's a very good team. Um, you know, we're not we're not talking in distance running, you know, we're not talking about it being Kenya or Ethiopia. Um but uh, who are, you know, by and large, the, the, the dominant countries in distance running. Um, you know, in a lot of respects, it's not going to be like the United States team, which, which wins a lot of medals. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's a very good team. Um, the, the Japanese Federation, the JAF, set uh, kind of surprisingly low bar for its expectations. They want, uh, their goal for the team is one medal, and five top eight finishes in all of the track and field events, including the marathon and race walks. Which, oh, really? Yeah, which is like very, seems it's very, very low. <laughs> it seems very low. It's not doesn't seem very ambitious, um, considering uh, the, the the quality of the people they have there. Um, I think uh, the potential medal events, uh, you know, the, the ones where where there's a, a good chance, uh, women's marathon for sure. Um, that's always been a very strong one. Um, for Japan, um, they've got Kayoko Fukushi, is uh, the Japanese national record holder for a, a, a wide number of events. Um, I guess most relevant to the marathon uh, would be she's a national record holder in the half marathon. Okay. Um, she really struggled a lot for to to become a marathoner. Um, uh, I, I think she she. Well, I, I guess I won't go there. I have I have opinions about why she struggled a bit, but uh, that's not that relevant. But uh, she she had a big breakthrough with uh, the Moscow World Championships. She won the bronze medal in uh, in the marathon in uh, extreme heat conditions, okay. there, which was very good. So she's proven she's she's strong in heat. She's got that base covered, and then um, which is good might, for Rio, obviously. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, and then in January at uh, the uh, Osaka International Women's Marathon. Um, she won in a very fast time. She won in 2:22:17, uh, which you know the Japanese national record is 2:19. Uh, three Japanese women have broken 2:20, so by that standard, 2:22 is is not great. But on the world level, 2:22 is uh, still very competitive, and mm. um, that's a significant improvement to uh, how strong she was when she won the medal in heat in Moscow uh, three years ago. So. Since winning a medal in heat, she's proven that she's close to as fast as uh, as the East Africans, as the Kenyans and Ethiopians. So she's got that. She's got speed. She's got heat credentials. She's definitely a medal con- uh, contender. Um, she, the only uh, possible cause for concern with her, she had um, some issues with inflammation in uh, one of the metatarsals in her right foot, uh, kind of late spring. And so she had a few setbacks in training. Um, I'm not sure what the current situation is with with her. Uh, she withdrew from a half marathon that she planned to do as a tune-up race. Um, so, mm. bit of a question mark there. But she's, uh, in terms of running events as an individual, she's, I would say, the strongest medal contender. Um, the other two Japanese women, uh, Tomomi Tanaka and Mai Ito, were also quite strong. Tanaka, in particular, two twenty three nineteen, I believe, uh, which she ran in uh, in Nagoya. In March, which is also you know one of the the fastest Japanese times in mm. quite a few years, um, she could uh, she could be a dark horse there as well. Um, I think the Japanese men's four by one hundred team uh, they fully believe that they're a medal uh, medal contender. You know, Japanese men won in in the four by one hundred uh, won the the bronze medal in um, the Beijing Olympics, and I believe that's being upgraded to a silver medal uh, due to the the Jamaican doping situation. Um, okay. uh, but uh, one of one of the, the athletes who ran on the Jamaican team um, 
has been has has since tested positive, and I believe that Jamaica is being stripped. I, I'm not sure of the current situation with that either, but uh, uh, I believe that Jamaica is being stripped of its gold medal, in which case Japan would be upgraded to silver. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, point being, um, Japan did win legitimately win an Olympic medal in the Beijing four by one hundred, and the mm. team they have now is very strong. Uh, six young guys. Um, you know, they have the four main guys alternates as well. Um, who, depending on who exactly they choose for the team, all of them are very strong. And uh, everything they've said, you know, they, they fully believe that they've got the, the capability to medal there. So definitely watch out for the 4x100. Um, the other two events where there's a, a good medal chance um, the, are the men's race walks, the 20-kilometer and 50-kilometer race walks. Okay. Uh, so those are the best contenders for medals. Um, there's, uh, you know, certainly lots of other interesting people there. Um, I kind of feel like the men's marathon team is not getting the respect it deserves. Um, it, there's no really big stars on uh, on on the men's marathon team, but it's 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 a pretty quality lineup. Um, you've got Satoru Sasaki, who uh, Sasaki is a two uh, two o eight marathoner. He ran um, two o eight fifty six, I believe it is. Uh, yeah, two o eight fifty six. Um, in Fukuoka in uh, December, which, you know, in most other countries, he would be, uh, outside of East Africa, he would be hailed as, uh, you know, as, as uh, a major star with that kind of time. In Japan, mm. he's kind of like, hmm, you know, he didn't run, <laughs> he didn't run 207, hmm. uh, <laughs> he didn't run 206. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, he's interesting. Uh, you know, he, he's never really run that spectacularly. Um, a couple of years ago, he ran a 209, and then uh, really ran really, really well in uh, in Fukuoka with a 208.56. He, he was right there with the leaders until late in the race. So that was that was a pretty impro- impressive breakthrough. Um, there's a young guy named uh, Hisanori Kitajima, uh, who's only run three marathons, but uh, very impressive uh, performances so far. His debut marathon in Nobeoka. Um, he was was it 2014 I think. Um, he ran a, he ran 212 for the win there, and then in September the same year ran 212 to win the Sydney Marathon. And uh, okay. the, the Sydney course is quite technical, so a lot of hills and turns. So 212 there is quite a solid time. Okay. And then in uh, Lake Biwa in uh, March this year he ran 209.16, a massive PB, three minute PB, and he almost caught the winner. Uh, he almost ran down the top African for the win there. Uh, mm. So that was a big breakthrough. So he, he's pretty exciting. And then uh, the third guy is a guy named Suihiro Ishikawa, who I really like. Um, I've had the, the good fortune to work with him twice. Um, I took him to the Great Manchester Run 10-kilometer uh, road race in, uh, in the UK twice. And a uh, very nice guy. Um, he's a low 209 marathoner. Um, two things that's inter- interesting about him He's very, very, very stable. Um, he almost always runs 209 to 211. Okay. Uh, um, I want to say he's never run slower than 211. Um, I, I, I'm about 90% confident that's 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 accurate. Again, I, sorry, I have to look that up. But um, he's almost always 209, 210, 211. When he's raced overseas in Berlin and such, he's at the same level. When he races in Japan, he's at the same level. Um, so he's very, very stable. And the other thing that's interesting about him is he will be Japan's oldest Olympic marathoner ever. Oh, really? 36, yes. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's you were talking about a, a, a range, basically, of, like, high 208 to low 209. They're a very narrow range between the three guys. There's nobody really flashy, but uh, they're all, you know, very stable, very good. So, depending on how the race goes, you know, they could be up there, they could not be up there. We'll see. Mm. Um I think on the track, uh, in the long distances, uh, it's looking pretty exciting. Um, for the men, they've got the national record holders uh, for 5,000 meters and 10,000 meters. Uh, both of those records were broken last year. So you've got uh, the 5,000 meter national record holder, um, Suguru Osako, who runs for the Nike Oregon Project uh, in the U.S., okay. uh, which is uh, kind of unusual. Um, we've got uh, the 10,000 meter national record holder, Kota Murayama, um, who uh, who set that record in November last year, and then uh, the third guy on the distance team in the 10,000 meters is a guy named Yuta Shitara, who uh, runs for the Honda team. He's a he's a teammate of Ishikawa in the marathon. Um, he's also I was I was lucky when he was in university. Um, I took him to run the New York City half marathon um, as part of the program I set up between. Uh, 
the Japanese collegiate system and New York to bring over, you know, some of the top um, Hakone Yakiden runners to oh, run, okay. um, to run in uh, in the New York half. And so yeah, he was the first one I took over, and he ran really well there. And so now he's he's gone on to make the Olympic team. So that's uh, that's that's very exciting on a personal level. Um, I think the women's distance runners are also looking very strong. Um, there's a runner named Ayuko Suzuki who um, ran very 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 bravely in uh, the Beijing World Championships last year, and uh, she's run really fast, uh, five thousand meter and ten thousand meters, uh, fairly recently. Okay. So definitely remember that name, Suzuki. Um, I'm sure you'll be seeing her, you know, doing some front running um, in the five or ten. Um, quite a few other good women as well, um, but uh, those would be my picks uh, for for the distance events. Um, now, again, no, of course. I mean, yeah. like Russia, Russia, obviously, with with regards to um, athletics, has yeah. had a complete ban um, because of. Or have they? Well, I mean, with uh, <laughs> with athletics, haven't they? I mean, as a Overall team, maybe yeah. not. There's question marks, but athletics. I think that was their their appeal was over overturned, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's a, it's a fairly complicated situation. Um, so, so I was just wondering, like, with with yeah. the potential lack of Russian athletes in mm-hmm. athletics, mm-hmm. is that going to give uh, give Japan a bit of an edge? Um. Hmm. Let's see. Yes, uh, uh, with with regard to athletics, yeah, um, I, I believe at the moment there's only one Russian woman who's going to be competing. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, the, with, with the with the IAF, uh, when when they banned the the Russian team, they made exceptions for two women. Uh, okay. One of whom was the whistle. Stepanova was uh, the the whistleblower. Who yeah. I, okay. I saw I saw a news story on her recently. Yeah. She's like been in hiding. Yeah, essentially for like the, a few years now, and her husband worked for the Russian doping agency. That's right. That's right. And so he's, she was he's an been athlete. hiding. Yeah, so she was an athlete, and she had tested positive for doping all because she had been told to dope, and uh, her husband was in, was one of the Russian anti doping personnel, and kind of between them, they decided they had enough of it, and uh, you know they went to the world anti doping, they went to the IAF, and they said, we have all this information, and you know we want to reveal what's going on in Russia, and. Uh, the IAF and the World Anti-Doping Association basically sat on it, and so they. So they went to the media, right? Yeah, they went to the German journalist, and mm, yeah, uh, they made, he made a documentary, kind of a yeah, yeah. massive, and, like blew the doors open. Exactly right, right, and uh, so they're in hiding and all that, and the IAF kind of like uh, said, okay, so in in return for that, like you're eligible to compete at the Olympics under the international, like the the neutral flag. The, the so they walk under the Olympic <laughs> banner, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly, right. Mm. And then one other, one other Russian woman, uh, Klitschina, was was given uh, an exception as well. I'm not sure of the circumstances of that, but um, what happened? Uh, oh, sorry. So yes, so that that happened, and Russia appealed to the Court of Arbitration for Sport, the CAS, uh, um, last week, I believe, and mm. uh, the CAS upheld the IAF ban, and so then the it basically just came down finally to the IOC a couple of days ago, and the IOC sold it all out and said no um we're not going to uh, we're not going to uphold that uh the individual federations can decide whether or not they want to allow russian athletes to uh to compete and uh in the case of athletics stepanova the whistleblower cannot compete because oh, really? she tested, because she tested positive so um you know russia the iaf is not allowing the russian athletics uh, athletes to compete but other sports, you know, they can choose to allow Russians to compete um, if they have met specific criteria. But the IAF, uh, the the IOC um, singled out the the case of Stepanova, the whistleblower, who basically is uh, responsible for all of this coming to light, um, is not allowed to uh, to compete at the Olympics. Mm, okay, and, I know that. It, and so the IOC said, but tell you what, we'll invite you as a special guest and you can come watch the Olympics. So the message there, you know, the message seems pretty clear. Like if you're a whistleblower, if you give information that's going to reveal this kind of corruption and cheating that's going on on a large scale basis, basically you're going to get shafted. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, so many people, including myself are just so furious with the IOC and yeah. And it's, and it's sad to say, but I mean, I, it's what I expected. I mean, I mean, I wrote this on my Facebook page the other day, and I got a, I got a, I got a bit of a blowback from some Russian people who read my my page, and I was like, well, okay, so I kind of took down what I originally wrote, 
and then I thought a bit more, and then I wrote basically my thoughts in a bit better format. Mm -hmm. And I basically said, I mean, it, it was very clear. I mean, it was a Canadian who led. It was a Canadian um, lawyer who was uh, hired by WADA, who worked yep. with WADA to basically the World Anti-Doping Agency to look into everything that was happening. And it was very clear, and there was tons of evidence to show that it was clearly state-sponsored mm -hmm. on many levels, even mm -hmm. to the point of, like, the, the Russian state security Yep. Like being involved. And I mean, the way my opinion, the way I look at it is if it is clearly state sponsored doping, state sponsored mm -hmm. cheating, the state should be dealt with. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, an issue. Need, I mean, basically a lesson needs to be taught. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, un, you know, sure, it's unfair to some athletes who didn't dope. But mm -hmm. when a state is in, not just encouraging it, but implementing it. Mm -hmm. um, my opinion is that that state should be, how shall I say, censured. And um, an overall blanket ban is, is, in my opinion, I will, I will say that clearly, everyone, my opinion, as a non-journalist, um, as, as, a, as a podcaster, because a few mm -hmm. people before have said, what about your journalistic integrity? I'm like, well, I'm not a journalist. Journalist. Um, yes. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very unhappy with the IOC decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but yes, <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's a complicated situation. It's a complicated situation. Um, ultimately, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of money involved and yes. yeah. when you're talking about, you know, the Olympics and the IOC and such, I mean, really what it comes down to is the money. You know, yeah. it's, uh, there's this very there's, similar to FIFA. Yeah. The, you know, the concept of the Olympics as this, like, uh, you know, the, like the, the, the ultimate goal of the amateur that it's the, the temple of amateur sport is you know this I think this this shows pretty clearly that that's a I don't know if you want to call it like a marketing gimmick or like a marketing tool or image of some sort that's a, a load of hooey and some some might yeah, say you might some might say you know that that's that's used to uh, to sell their product and you know they're they're making billions of dollars off that and um, mm. you know, follow the money on that. Well, you know what? Let's let's jump back into some happier uh, yeah. information about uh, running in Japan, mm. and um, you know, so let's leave all the Olympic stuff behind. We're gonna see all the. Oh, actually, no. Here's one thing. Actually, I want, before actually, we, we leave. And yes, I had one. I had so I did have one more thing I wanted to say. But oh, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Go. Throw it up. No, no, you go first. That's fine. No, I was just curious with regards to the Rio Games. I know that yes. some athletes from different countries have actually because of the. Um, like for example, right now it's been all over the news that the Australian contingent, the Australian team, they don't want, they're not going to, Australia doesn't want to move their athletes into the Olympic village because it's mm. apparently really nasty and, yeah. you know, like there's like plumbing issues and it's not finished and, um, and, uh, th there have been quite a few high profile athletes who've actually said that they're not going to go to the Rio games because of the Zika fears, the crime mm -hmm. fears. Um, and I know like Canadian tennis player, Milos Ronich, who, just made it to the finals of Wimbledon. He was going to be playing for Canada, and he said, "I'm not going mm. because of the Zika fears." Mm. Um, have there been any Japanese athletes? And I mean, for me, it would seem kind of unlikely, but mm. I, I don't really follow it that closely. Have there been any similar cases in Japan with athletes or groups of athletes who are saying, "Hey, we don't want to go there"? Uh, not that I'm aware of. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there we go. Um, the the only thing I, I I've read. Um, in, in that's in any way in the direction of people being uncomfortable, expressing like uh, discomfort or, or such was um, an article I translated a few days ago about uh, the, the marathoners are in a bit of a quandary because they had booked their own hotels um, very close to the start and finish point. And uh, apparently the security in the area has turned out to be insufficient for them to be there and using it as a training base. Oh, okay. And the official, like the athletes' village, is quite a ways away, I guess, from where the the marathon starts and finishes. And the official um, Japanese team uh, training base is located twenty kilometers away, and oh. so they're they're in kind of a bind uh, in in terms of what they want to do uh, for, in terms of being based and being able to to go out for their daily runs, you know, while they're once they once they arrive in Rio. Mm. Um, and so that's that was that was the only thing that I've read that. It, in any way, you know, goes goes in that direction about people being uncomfortable or afraid. Okay. Yeah. Um, what was it that you wanted to add? About... Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say with regard to one more thing, just with regard to Russia. Um, mm -hmm. 
just to be completely fair, um, I, I, I think uh, it is in no way only a Russian issue. Mm, okay, yeah, very good uh, point to make. Yeah, uh, like you know, uh, my grandmother was born in uh, in Saint Petersburg, uh, so you know that's I, it, I, I'm not anti-Russian in any way whatsoever. Neither am I. Neither am I. Neither am yeah, I. Yeah. Um, I mean, hey, I'm from Canada. Ben Johnson, 1988, yeah. Seoul Olympics, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the pride of Canada. He was doping his butt off. Yeah, and I mean, I think like if you, it's it's not strictly a Russian issue, and you know, even if you look at like um, some of the people who represent some of, or work with some of the Russian athletes, also work with other Russian, uh, sorry, athletes from other Eastern, Eastern European nations who in the last few years have tested positive for the exact same things the Russians are doing. And, uh, you know, other countries outside of, you know, former Soviet nations um, also have uh, plenty of things. You know, the United States, look at their, their male sprinters. Well, I've, you know, I've even heard question marks about Kenyan runners. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, know, you know, there's... there's a lot uh, of people wonder about them recently. Um, yeah, there's, there's, it's not just wondering, you know, there, there's, uh, there are quite a few, um, you know, uh, even top level Kenyans have been uh, busted for, for drugs in the last few years. Yeah. Um, one of the most prominent European agents uh, who represents uh, most of the top Kenyans uh, was recently arrested in Kenya um, for, for uh, on charges of doping his athletes. And uh, he's currently, uh, I, I believe the situation is he's currently free in Kenya on bond, but the, while his trial is being processed, but the Kenyan government will not release his passport for him to attend the Rio Olympics. Mm. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it, there, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of questions, um, a lot of things going on in different places, and it's not strictly a Russian issue. And even the state-sponsored nature of it, I think, um, one thing that I haven't really seen adequately discussed is the fact that, um, you know, everybody's talking about this in terms of being a Russian state-sponsored issue. And yet, some of the very same people, as I said, some of the very same people who are dealing with some of these Russian athletes are also dealing with other Eastern European athletes who are also getting busted and testing positive. And so I think that the issue is a little bit deeper, maybe a little bit more widespread, a little more complicated than mm. being strictly Russia bad, you know, it's, mm. which I think, you know, the, the, the whole Russia bad uh, type kind of um, image resonates with a lot of people for historical reasons, but is not necessarily a completely accurate description of the, the reality of the current situation, I think. Mm. Okay, interesting. That's, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that input because, I mean, I'm someone who, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing what the media throw yeah. out and of, uh, obviously, uh, you know, I suppose when you think about it, when you step back and you look at what are the media trying to do, the media are trying to get clicks, hits, just like anybody else um, mm. on their site. So sometimes, um, you know, what they say, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Yeah. You know, um, uh, okay, well, hey, okay, on to the more, uh, how shall I say, just on to other topics with yes. regards to running. A few things I, I'm, I'm curious to throw at your way. Okay. Um, it, for the people out there in just Japan podcast land who are listening, um, you know, as I go through the Japan, uh, running news, your, your blog, your website, mm -hmm. um, a few things that pop out to me that kind of strike me as, I mean, again, these are rhetorical questions. These are for the listeners. I kind of know the answers myself, but, um, you, you can explain them way better than I can. Sure. Um, you know, Often when I see, uh, you know, you talk about races and you ha you give race breakdowns, you mention the term of like corporate teams and corporate yes. runners. Mm. Now, this these are not like when you're thinking of athletics in Canada or America or the UK or Australia, you don't hear this term corporate runners or like corporate teams. Yep. Um, it seems like a very different type of athletic structure going on here in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what are corporate teams and are they professional athletes? Mm -hmm. And what, what's what's the deal? Okay, uh, that are they professional athletes makes it a significantly longer answer, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, like basically it, the way to, the way to think about it, if you're not familiar with uh, with with Japanese distance running, is um, the the system here for for what the options are post college um, are is is it's a pretty unique situation. They have what basically would be considered a professional sports league um, in most other countries. Okay. Um, they have teams of distance runners that uh, run for a particular corporate sponsor. Um, 
I, I, I should say that technically the term is like industrial runner. Um, like the actual okay. translation that, they, 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 that the corporate league uses is industrial because of like historical reasons like post-war. This, this system began in the post-war era and most of the companies that were sponsoring these teams were heavy industries. Um, today, that's not at all true. All kinds of different companies, you know, hotel chains, makeup companies and that um, sponsor these teams. And so I, I use the term corporate runners and okay. I think that's, that's, that's caught on to some degree. Um, because I think it's a bit more accurate reflection of the current reality. But um, yeah, basically they have, you know, company teams, makeup teams, car companies, uh, heavy industries, hotels, everything, hotel chains um, that will sponsor a uh, running team. And, um, it's not, and it's just not just running too in Japan, right? Like that carries on to other sports as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's, yeah. Um, that's, 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 that's accurate. They do have... Um, like rugby, baseball. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Other sports as well, they'll have um, you know, these, these kinds of corporate teams. It's um, cor- like they're, they're essentially like leagues onto their own, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you could consider it, uh, you know, from... Maybe the, air quotes semi-pro? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I was going to say, you, you could consider it like a professional sports league. Um, the... The nominal concept is like their company employees who happen to do this sport and they do it under the company name and so the company gives them a bit of support. Um, you know, the, the degree to which that is true, I think, varies from, uh, from company to company. Um, mm. Looking at distance running, you know, there are certainly uh, teams, corporate teams, where the people really are working full time for the company and they have breaks where they do their training during the day and that sort of thing. Okay. So, um, so that's that's very close to uh, you know semi pro or you know sponsored amateurs and such. And there are teams where you know basically the desk jobs they have are just paper and they're professional athletes. Mm, okay. um, so you know it really varies a lot from depending on the situation of, uh, of the runners and the teams, um, the, the particular teams. But uh, so in in Japan they do not consider them professional; they consider them all amateur. But again, you know the degree to which it's actually true varies. Mm, um, okay. So you know for, in terms of thinking of it from you know a North American or you know perhaps European. Uh, perspective um you know consider them pro teams i i tend i tend to use the term pro as well um because it, i think it it, it matches the, the concept of pro you know when they're working for these companies um they're doing some some amount of work for the company a desk job or such but they're basically being uh, supported to run for the company okay um, yeah you know they they have professional coaching you know they get uh, they they work a maximum of you know three four hours a day in a lot of cases uh, for the company and they have lots of training time. Um, you know, they get time to go off. They go off for the summer to Hokkaido exclusively to train. There's, you know, there's no day-to-day work happening there. Um, and, uh, in return they run for the company and that is typically running in the Ekidens, the road relays that we, uh, we mentioned earlier, the new year's Ekiden, the January 1st one is the corporate men's national championships. And that's really the focus of the whole year. And, uh, mm. that, as that has become kind of bigger and bigger, you know, we talked about the increasing popularity of the TV broadcasts and such. Um, that has impacted to some degree the, I think, the, the development of the Japanese marathoners. Okay. Um, you know, they're they're they've become more and more limited. Um, I mean, they've they've always been limited to some degree, but become more and more limited in terms of which marathons they can run and when, because they have to be ready on January first to run. Uh, you know, between like eight and 22 kilometers depending on what stage they're running in this road relay oh really okay yeah and so that really can can impact their marathon training um, uh, yeah, yeah. so you know it's like the 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 Ekiden teams and such were originally conceived of as a way to develop marathoners but the Ekiden itself has become more and more important and a lot of their uh you know their bonuses and their salary and that and the coach's jobs depends on how the team performs at the new year Ekiden more than necessarily it depends on how one guy might do it in the marathon mm, and okay. yeah and so like the, the the weight of importance has shifted more towards the ekiden and so i think like if people talk about uh you know like why aren't if japanese college runners are so good or such why aren't they more successful at the world level in that and you know i, mean, I think if you really like think carefully about that situation the, the question only answers itself um you know like some people say uh, you know, oh, they're just training too hard or they're running on roads too much, you know, fa- fairly simplistic answers. But I think the, the issue is really more like if if you're the coach of one of these teams, you know, you have um, tremendous pressure to perform in a road relay on January 1st. And so how do you perform as a team in that? 
everybody has to be good. So as a coach, you can't put all of your resources into developing the one really talented guy at the expense of everybody else. Because if you have one good runner in a road relay or in any kind of relay, you're going to lose as a team because the other runners on average won't be good enough. And so you have to develop everybody to a high level as opposed to really cultivating the real talent. Mm. And so the focus there is on developing a large number of good runners, not necessarily on developing world beaters. Mm. Right. So you have tremendous depth. You have a lot of really good runners, but very few people who would go on to become medalists. Okay. That's kind of the way I come to think of it. That you have, you know, it's if you think of like the American development system, you have a few guys who really, really get everything they need to become the best in the world. You know, people like Galen Rupp. Um, before that, maybe like uh, you know, Dathan Ritzenheim, uh, Ryan Hall, people like that. Um, and then not a lot of depth. You know, like the numbers really fall off quite quickly. Um, mm. In Japan, you've got a lot more guys running at a high level, but you have very few people. I think I, I fully believe there are people who are who have the talent to be that level, but you 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 have very few people being developed to go on to that level. Well, that's okay. That, that was an interesting thing about development. Um, mm-hmm. I'm I'm really curious, and, and this is something I wanted to talk to you about. And yeah. you know, cultural differences, country differences. You know, okay. So I'm I'm gonna think I'm gonna throw because I'm a Canuck, you're a Canuck. Um, um, actually, ironically enough, believe it or not, last week, uh, the, the episode that uh, I'm re- we're recording this, by the way, guys, on the 26th of July, today episode, an episode dropped, and it's the guy who runs thehaunchandtigers.com, which is an English language news podcast about the Haunch and Tigers, and, oh, he's, yeah? and he's from Winnipeg. No kidding. Yeah, um, ironically enough. <laughs> um, right. But, um, you know, we, we talked a lot about the differences in the kind of the baseball scene, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like... Pro ball in America and Canada, or I mean, essentially America, um, mm-hmm. you know, versus pro ball in, in Japan. And, and the system is so different that, like, for example, in with baseball in Japan, you know, really the kind of pinnacle of things is Koshien, you know, uh-huh. the, the high school level. And that's where yeah. you get plucked up. If you're mm-hmm. like one of those, if you're a Koshien winner, you're a top player in Koshien, that's where you're going to be drafted into the, the professional world. Mm-hmm. And you get kids who are going like directly from essentially like high school into the pro leagues mm-hmm. whereas in in north america you know if, if you're a top high school athlete you're going to go to college or university and then you're going to play in a big team mm-hmm. um if you're an amazing canadian player you're going to move down and play in the ncaa yeah, of course, um yeah. and then and then from there you're going to if you get drafted you're then going to play you're going to play minor leagues you're not mm-hmm. just going to go to the major leagues mm-hmm. you're going to play a ball double a ball triple a and then you're going to you're going to work your way into the majors um, and I also think of like, uh, you know, I've got it right in front of me right now. I've got, um, you know, uh, Andre DeGrasse's Wikipedia page open mm-hmm. and Andre DeGrasse is the Canadian phenom in sprinting mm-hmm. Ca- Canada's hope, um, you know, when it comes to the hundred meter and stuff. And I mean, Andre DeGrasse yep. was, he was born in, in, in just outside of Toronto and Markham mm-hmm. and, um, you know, you know, he raced in Canada, but of course, because, there are more options in the States. He, he now races, he runs for the university of Southern California. Mm-hmm. He's an NCAA champion. Mm-hmm. So the, the, you know, the, of, of course the best Canadian athletes are going to move to the States because there's more opportunities, right? Yep. For better coaching, better athletic programs, mm-hmm. um, this and that. Um, you know, so I, I'm curious, like how does like a, a trajectory of like, say you get this, you get this kid in elementary school who mm-hmm. just is, damn faster than everybody else Mm -hmm. how do they go from being that damn fast kid in elementary school Mm -hmm. to making it to the olympic team maybe in japan versus say another country is Mm -hmm. is is, i mean because i mean we're talking very different things like in japan there's like corporate teams yeah we don't have that back home you know the athletes take a very it's a very different path athletes have so if if you're a kid in japan who wants to run in the olympics maybe in the marathon uh, you want to run you want to be a sprinter what kind of path might you follow okay um well uh, i think men's distance running is kind of a special case okay um for for reasons which we'll talk about in a second but um, like the basic trajectory is, you know, if starting with like junior high school, maybe, okay. um, you know, like if your goal is to get to the top, like the route is pretty much clearly mapped out. Um, and it's more true for distance running than, than sprinting and such. 
and certainly more true than for field events and, and middle distance and such. But basically, like, you want to go to one of the good sports high schools, and then uh, that's going to get you, um, if, if, you're, if you excel at one of those schools, that's going to get you kind of picked up by one of the good universities or... So there, or, there are special schools, right? Like Yeah, yeah, a, there's a, schools a, that are stronger, yeah, yeah. A, a um, few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, I interviewed um, Tom Gates, um, who uh, used to live in Korea, and he's a judo guy. And he talked about judo junior high schools and judo high schools in Korea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in in Japan, they have those. There are certain schools that are kind of renowned for their, you know, kind of prowess in different sports. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay. Um, I mean, if if you're into baseball, um, you know what happened uh, with uh, just uh, one of the the kind of legendary baseball uh, high schools just had its uh, its final game. Um, they. Uh, uh, they had kind of a situation where um, evidence came out of, you know, abuse of the athletes by coaches, um, you know, physical abuse and that, um, which is quite common here, um, mm. that, uh, you know, in traditionally, you know, coaches will, uh, you know, physically discipline athletes and such. And there's a lot of physical and mental abuse of the athletes. And one of the top baseball high schools uh, that came out that that was like systematically happening. And um, they basically uh, opted to, it's a bit of simplification, but they basically opted to disband the baseball program. Um, oh, they, stopped, okay. they stopped recruiting um, you know, incoming students for the baseball team. And uh, the team this year was the, basically the last team they're going to have. And you know, they tried to make Koshi and the big, uh, the big national um, high school uh, baseball uh, meet and, uh, or baseball tournament and um, lost you know, in the ninth inning. Uh, so it's pretty dramatic. Um, mm. So, but yeah, yeah, but yeah. Anyways, yeah. Point being, um, there are specific schools in different sports that are kind of like this is the school to go to for this or this. And so, yeah, as you know, as a junior high school student, if you're talented, you're going to want to kind of focus on trying to get to one of those high schools, and then that would take you to one of the right universities or to one of the right corporate teams. You know, corporate teams will recruit straight out of high school, um, and then that's that's kind of your development from there. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, with regard to the the reason I kind of put aside the men's distance running specifically is because the Hakone Ekiden, which we've mentioned a few times, yeah, um, you know, is like exerts a massive gravitational pull on all of that um, because you know it's it's the premier sporting event in Japan. Um, it's the the biggest TV event, you know, the biggest, the most prestigious sporting event, as I said. And so, you know, if you're a, a high school distance runner. Um, how many guys get to run the Olympics? You know, like a very, very small number of people would ever make the Japanese Olympic team. Yeah. But, but if you get to run in Hakone, you know, 200 guys run Hakone every year, roughly 200 guys. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's typically 20 teams, 10 guys per team, 200 guys. Every single one of those guys is on national TV. Every single one of them gets their names mentioned. Everybody in the country gets to know who you are. Yeah, and they're going to be in the local news. They're going to be yeah, ho- hometown yeah. heroes. If you rep- if you represent in Hakone, you are a national celebrity, you know, and you get your moment in the sun. And that's I think I, I, a lot of people these days talk about Hakone being too big. That 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 it's really like a focus. That like when you're in junior high school, you're like, I want to run Hakone, and so you work your ass off in junior high school to get into the right high school, and then you 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 kill yourself in high school to get into the right university, and then you know there are 50, 60 guys on your university team, and you want to be one of the ten of them who make Hakone, right? And if you if you run Hakone once in your university career. Is the greatest moment of your whole life. I mean, that's that's all they think about, right? And a lot of people say like that is a, a bad thing because that's all they're thinking about. They're not thinking about going on and becoming Olympic marathoners, right? Mm. Um, that's people say. Uh, there's a lot of talk here about that's a big problem with Hakone that it's 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 too much and that. But at the same time, you know, I think it's I, personally, I think it's a beautiful thing because you know the the if you look at who the olympic marathoners are a lot of the best guys on the olympic team that they're all people they're or not all but they're mostly people who have run Hakone and did well in Hakone and that and so like the best guys are still going to get recruited out of university and go on to corporate teams and many of them will get to run in the olympics anyways but it does give the the 190 other guys their moment in the sun you know they get they get to be heroes just for one day as it were you know mm yeah, so, sure. yeah. So, so that's 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 kind of a, a, a special direction, I think, for distance men. That they even more so than for other sports, they're really focusing on getting into the right high school, the right university, and, uh, and that's going to take them to Hakone. And then the top guys from there will get recruited by corporate teams, and then go on, you know, run the corporate ekidens, and that some small percentage of those guys will run marathons. A very small percentage of those guys will be successful in marathons, in marathons, and 
some percentage of those guys will become Olympic marathoners. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a pyramid, I guess. Um, mm. As you work your way up the, hi- the hierarchy, uh, the, the, the number gets smaller and smaller. But, um, you know, the goal there, the goal of everything is to become an Olympic marathoner for sure. Mm. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, you know what? Hey, I don't want to keep you much later, Brett. I want to thank you so much for, for joining us. It's yeah. know, late into the evening as we, we conduct our interview. Um, so, uh, you know, the Rio Games is going to be coming up soon. Mm-hmm. I'm sure we're all going to be following it. It's, it's, I mean, it's a, the Rio Games are complicated for many reasons aside from athletics. Mm. You know, the, 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 the crime thing, the health thing, the Zika thing. It's going to be yeah. a very interesting thing to follow. Um, yeah. Okay, but that aside, walking away from there, talking about the Japan running news, yep. your, your stuff, where can people find you online and on social media? Um, at the moment, uh, I've got my uh, website, um, you know, Japan Running News. Uh, if you Google it, it'll be the first thing that pops up, I'm sure. Um, yep, I'm also, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I'm on Twitter. Um, JRN Headlines uh, is my main account on Twitter. Um, I also have a secondary account, JRN Live, which I use for live tweeting Japanese races. Um, that's, you know, I, I don't use it a lot. It's at specific times of the year. And when I use it, it's very high density. <laughs> so don't be Yeah, absolutely. Like, like during the Hakone, the, the Hakone Ekiden. Yeah, yeah like that, right? Hakone Ekiden, I'll be tweeting like... I, I actually, I, I, I definitely, I mean, I follow both of your Twitter feeds, but I mean, <laughs> that's how I get like... Like for during the Hakuday Hakuday in this year, for example, like we had to go out and do like Hatsumode and we had to do like we had to go and go to my family, my my wife's family's house and this and that. So I wasn't allowed to watch it. Mm-hmm. So I was like trying to stealthily follow your Twitter feed when not being watched. You know, like I was, I was like, oh my god, what's going on here? That's what it's there for. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's it's there for the guys who got to yeah. do the people who have to do things who can't just yeah. sit in front of the TV for seven hours a day. Yeah, yeah. So if you're interested in following, you know, a Japanese race live, that's what JRN Live is for. JRN Headlines is generally links to uh, to articles on the Japan Rain News main site and then various other things. Um, I think I say in the description that it uh, there's occasional tweeting in Japanese, occasional earthquake coverage, and mm-hmm. musical interludes. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, don't be alarmed if I tweet in Japanese sometimes, um, which I do. And uh, I uh, will occasionally, when there's, you know, earthquakes, disasters, and I tweet about those. Um, and then also, um, you know, I kind of come from a music background, so um, I, do, I do tweet uh, about music from time to time. Um, but uh, primarily, yeah. primarily just talking about Japanese distance running. Yeah, I mean, like, the yeah. Japan Running News is the place to go. If, if you're really interested in running and athletics in Japan and English, this is the really the only place to go um, to get all the news. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to put all those links in the show notes at justjapanstuff.com. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Brett, for, for joining us again. It's been a long time. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. We, we do need to do this more often. That'd be great. Not uh, not every one hundred episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I look forward to uh, seeing how you do this uh, in, in this your upcoming marathon. Um, good luck with that. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's you know I, to be honest, it's been a long time, and um, my work life, my life schedule has become a lot more complex than earlier in my like just a few years ago when I was running before. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a lot more challenging to fit in times. But mm-hmm. uh, my my goal for this one is honestly just to finish it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not trying to, there's no PR times, this or that, like when I was a regular runner in the past, this is more about just trying to ignite the passion again and get back into it. And, uh, um, no, there's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. You know, um, it's, I think like you're, you're, people get too hung up on, you know, like I don't perform like I used to, but performances are always relative to, you know, like where you are in your life, where you are in your life and what you put into it, what you want yeah. from it. I mean, yeah. um, you know, I used to always jokingly say that I was always a beer runner. Uh-huh. You know, I'm, I'm I'm the kind of guy who like you know when I finish a when I finish a long run, I would finish it by going to a convenience and getting a big tall can. Yeah. Um, and that's you know, there's a lot of other people out there like that as well. Um, but the difference was between now and then is that I still like my tall cans, but I used to run 80 kilometers a week, mm-hmm. and I don't do that now. So um, you know, the bod shows it. <laughs> um, <laughs> the bond shows it, yeah. um, but you know, so losing a few kilos, getting out there and no, I just, you know, I, I do, you know, I started running, I started running marathons when I was 30, 
actually, I started running when I was like 32. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Before then, I used to do like, um, like in high school and in my 20s, I did like boxing. I did like boxing and Taekwondo, like martial arts and kind of combat sports. Mm. So I was always very fit because of that. Um, but the running started, uh, but the, the entire time I did that, I was actually a massive chain smoker. No kidding. Really? I, didn't know that. I, used to, I smoked two packs a day from the time I was like 19 until I was about 30. Uh, so I, I, I trained like, and the ironic thing is I, I trained very seriously in like Taekwondo and boxing, but uh, I was also a heavy smoker. <laughs> Oh gosh, golly. Um, so uh, I don't do the I don't do the combat sports anymore. And actually, I, I do have a love a, a warm place in my heart for them. Um, and believe it or not, I'm someone who doesn't like fighting, but I like the sports. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but uh, the the running came out of me quitting smoking. Actually, hmm. that's where that kind of spawned from. It was okay. like oh, kind of a, a a rebirth, so to speak. Hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm. I'm this is the year getting back into it. We're getting back into it. Gonna run my. They're gonna run the first marathon in a few years, and we're gonna take it from there. And I do have a goal in the future. Huh? I don't know when, but in in the next few years, I definitely want to run like a fifty miler, or so. I want to do an ultra, uh, or maybe the daydream is to do like a hundred k. Uh, have I told you? But I think the kids. I think my kids need to get a, a, a bit older for that. <laughs> Because uh, where, where they don't need dad around. If I can make a suggestion. Yes. And if you're not familiar with it, you can Google it and you will understand perhaps. Set as your goal running comrades. Oh, that's in South Africa. Yes. Yes, I am very familiar with that one. Okay. I mean, as in from listening to a lot of podcasts. It was a, a 20-year dream of mine and I did it for the first time last year and then went back for the return trip this year. Oh, did you? Wow. The, the, or they, they called the comrades or something down yeah. there wow yeah. you did it wow really Two years in a row. yeah back to back so that uh, is that is like um that's like the super bowl in south africa yes it is that's like national tv that's a big thing yeah yeah i i, I could talk about it for an entire other well podcast. you know what let's get you yeah. back on for another podcast we can talk about that yeah but um awesome certainly like if you do it you will never regret it you well mm. you'll, you'll regret it while you're doing it but um, <laughs> uh, once you're done you will never regret it it's everything you've heard about it uh, like all, is is true it's 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 a wonderful experience so next for you should be like the western states 100 no 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 no. come on no 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 no, no, you seen the die okay okay the bad water comrades comrades how about the how about the bad water do you want to do the bad water nope no i'm not an ultra guy i just i wanted to do this specifically you you, you don't want to you don't you don't want to run 130 miles through death valley it was an epic beautiful Extremely agonizingly painful and uh, and life changing experience, and that's enough. I don't I, I don't want more. Do you have Do you have um, Did you write a, Do you got a blog post about that with some photos? Uh, I wrote one last year. Oh, okay, um, cool, then, cool. Uh, this, I, this year, it you know, I, I I guess. Okay, it, well, I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna search for. Okay, so in the in the 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 show notes for this week's episode, yes. of course, I'm gonna post all the links. I'm gonna post the links to the your 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 blog. Mm-hmm. Um, both of your Twitter feeds, and um, I will then search around, and I'll find. Uh, I want to find a post with some pictures from the Comrades Marathon. Yeah, it was. I, I believe it was called On Comrades, and it okay. was like the beginning of June last year. So it should be cool. Easier. I'll put a link to that in the show notes, guys. All Thanks. of you out there listening, you go to justjapanstuff.com, and you can find all the links to Brett's all the social media stuff will be there. Thanks. And go, go check out his website. Go follow him on Twitter. Um, this guy knows the stuff about running <coughs> athletics in Japan. That's why he's here tonight. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Cool, man. Well, it was great to talk to you again after, wow, 103 episodes. Yep. Wow. Long time. May you have, may you have at least 103 more. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. And we'll definitely get you on before <laughs> the next 103. Okay. All right. Awesome, man. Well, you have a good evening. Please hang up and try again. Now I want to thank Brett for taking the time to stop by the Just Japan podcast and talk to us all about the Rio games. And uh, as you can tell, the man really knows his stuff. He is he truly is an expert on athletics in Japan. Um, and it's really great to have experts on the podcast. Now, of course, you can check out all of his stuff at japanrunningnews.blogspot.jp or .com. Uh, that link will be in the show notes at 
uh, just Japan, uh, just Japan stuff.com. And of course his Twitter links will be there. The, the Twitter links are key. Go check out his Twitter links and follow him, um, for some great commentary about the Olympics. Um, it's definitely worthwhile. So go to just Japan stuff.com to check out all that stuff. We're sorry. The number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Now I'm going to throw it there to you guys. Uh, all the links of course will be in the show notes, but, um, support the just Japan podcast over on Patreon.com. We've got a renewed Patreon account, uh, I should say campaign, a renewed Patreon campaign, really trying to get this thing going again. Um, I've been, in the last few months, getting a lot more passionate about the podcast, putting out a lot more episodes on a more frequent basis. Um, it's been several months where I put out an episode every week, and again, I'm, I'm really kind of getting the fire, the passion for podcasting again, and I really love this show, and I love you guys. Um, and if you love the Just Japan podcast, hey, check out patreon.com, you know, you can always support the show that way. Um, there's a lot of incentives there now, mentions in the show, uh, bonus podcast episodes. I've just uh, finished recording one uh, that's going to be sent out to a couple of awesome patrons, awesome people who have supported the podcast. That's something that's sent out to them only, only they can hear and listen to. And you can listen to these uh, bonus podcasts too if you yourself become a patron of the podcast and support it. So patron.com slash just Japan podcast, patron.com slash just Japan podcast links will be in the show notes. We appreciate your support. If you love this show, you can support it that way. A lot of work goes into this guys. Um, several hours a week. Um, a lot of stuff goes into putting out this free podcast and, um, you know, Hey, we appreciate the support because you guys are awesome. And I'm trying to do my best for you. And again, Everything helps make the show better. So go check it out. All right, folks, we're back with the mailbag section of the Just Japan podcast. He says shibbity. It's been a really long time, and I recently asked some people if I, 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 I shouted it on social media. If you have any questions for a renewed mailbag section, please send them my way. I got a great question um, from Benjamin um, about living in Japan, and he wrote, what is your favorite smaller city or town in Japan? I'm trying to find good options for cities to live in via JET, the JET program, the Japan Exchange for Teachers program, or Exchange and Teaching program. Um, wow, uh, you know what, uh, Benjamin, I haven't had the opportunity to travel as much around Japan as I would like to, but um, a couple of places I would throw out, smaller places, um, maybe even quasi-rural, uh, in northern Hyogo Prefecture, uh, along the Sea of Japan is uh, Kinosaki. You know, Kinosaki is a famous tourist area known for its onsens and beautiful vistas and scenery and crab and all that stuff. Um, it's a beautiful, gorgeous town. Love it. Or a small city. Now, that would be a fabulous place to be stationed in, put in, placed in as a jet. Um, also, anywhere like in Gifu Prefecture, up in the mountains. I mean, I'm a nature guy. As, you know, ghetto onsen area. Um, just you know, s smaller towns and cities in Gifu Prefecture. I I think I went there once and I just loved it. It was just so gorgeous. Um, so I'm gonna say Northern Hyogo Prefecture, Hyogo Prefecture, uh, and also Gifu. Uh, I'm gonna throw the throw those out to you. Um, and I, I know there's many other beautiful, gorgeous places here in Japan. Just I haven't had much of a, a chance to travel in the smaller, the more rural areas, I've really only kind of bounced from big city to big city, you know, Fukuoka, Osaka, Hiroshima, Nagoya, Tokyo, that kind of thing. Yeah, so um, Benjamin, I hope that helps. And thank you so much for your question. Really appreciate it. And for anyone out there who wants to uh, have me answer their question on the Just Japan podcast uh, in the mailbag section, which is something I want to do more frequently, you can send me your question at justjapanpodcast at gmail.com, justjapanpodcast at gmail.com, or send me a tweet, uh, send me a DM on Twitter, um, you know, ask me the question on the Facebook page, uh, send me a, a private message on Facebook. Hey, that's cool. And all those links to the social media stuff are all going to be in the show notes. And I'll throw it out there right now. Twitter, you want to follow me on Twitter, that's at jlandkev. On Instagram at JLandKev. Uh, the Facebook page is awesome. Go check it out. That's a Boots on Kevin Facebook page because that's who I am on the YouTubes. Um, so go check that out at Boots on Kevin. And uh, all those links will be in the show notes at JustJapanStuff.com. Now, of course, one thing I appreciate that you guys do each and every week is that you share the podcast. Um, please help support the podcast. When I um, tweet out links, to podcast episodes, please retweet them. When I um, 
put out Facebook posts about the Just Japan podcast, please share the Facebook posts. That would be really awesome. That's a great way to get more ears on the podcast, more people listening to it. So when I, uh, for example, when this week's episode drops and I post it on Facebook, um, please share it, share it, share it, share it. And that would make me very happy. And I know who you are when you share it. When I post this episode on Twitter, please share it. Get more people listening to the podcast. Get more people talking about it. Get more people excited about it. And hey, in turn, I'll be more excited and more motivated to put up more episodes and create more awesome for you guys. All right. Well, that that just about does it for another episode, another week of the Just Japan podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. My name is Kevin O'Shea. I am a Canuck. That's right. I'm from northern Kanakistan. I'm a Canadian who lives in Kobe, Japan. And I am the producer, the organizer, the wrangler, the host, the guy behind the Just Japan podcast. And of course, I have a team that's behind me each and every week, my supportive family who puts up with me taking a lot of time to do this awesome show and who puts up with me um, sacrificing a lot of time to put the show together for you guys. So um, thank you so much to the Just Japan podcast team, even though I know you're not listening. And thank you so much to each and every one of you out there who takes the time to download this podcast. Thank you so much to each and every one of you who takes the time to interact with me on social media, because I love doing that, guys. Um, Of course, also, you can check out what Japan looks like over on my YouTube channels, youtube.com slash Kevin and youtube.com slash Kev. Again, everything, all these links, and there's so freaking many links I talk about. They're all over under episode number 119 of the podcast at justjapanstuff.com. So that's it, guys. I hope you're happy. I hope you're healthy. Wherever you are in the world, I'll be talking to you real soon. Yeah.